Welcome to the podcast today on attracting and retaining talent. I'm Danielle Goodrick, the Knowledge Product Manager at SIPS, and joining me today I have Scott Dance, Director of Hayes Procurement and Supply Chain. Scott's over 18 years experience and he advises clients on workforce management solutions and provides strategic um, leadership to Hayes Procurement and Supply Chain recruitment experts. Scott and I have worked together now for a number of years um, on the Salary Guide through our knowledge partnership. So thank you, Scott, for joining us today um, to share your tips and insights. Um, it's the sixth year now that we're running the Salary Guide. Um, 2020's here already, can't quite believe it. And it's a bit of a different year this year, isn't it? Indeed, yes. So, yeah. You could say that. <laughs> <laughs> we're in a different situation now, obviously, um, in lockdown and coming out of lockdown. So the profession looks slightly different. Um, the recruitment market will be slightly different. What um, the individuals are looking for from their organisations will be different. So um, thank you for all for joining us today. What we're going to do is a deeper dive um, into some of the insights and tips um, Scott can share with us um, on how you can create a successful team and attract the best talent to your team. So Scott, this year our report highlights that employers continue to struggle to find the right talent and competition remains high. So what are your top tips for those employers struggling to retain talent in their teams? Thank you, Danielle. So, yeah, good, good question, actually. Um, if I kind of start off with some statistics around this year's procurement uh, salary guide, that actually, if you look at it, 54% of organisations said they struggled to find the right talent last year. And prior to the COVID pandemic, 67% of organisations were looking to recruit over the next 12 months. So it seems there'll be a lot of activity over the next year, even with the global crisis, which, given the publicity, which hopefully um, has been perceived as positive in the raise and the profile of procurement, um, there should be more companies looking to invest in their procurement functions. I guess then if I take that further on to answer your question, Danielle, uh, if I split this into two buckets, so attracting and rot uh, retaining. So from an attraction point of view, uh, properly drafted job and personal specifications are vital for attracting talent. So take into account which skills your current teams are lacking and make sure to highlight these. Also include information about your organization's values and culture as increasingly it's important to these employees and people looking to um, join your organization. Also think about streamlining your application process as much as possible. For example, how easy is it for a candidate to apply for a new role? Do they have to fill in a long online form? How many rounds of interviews are there? And how long will they have to wait before they get a final job offer after the final interview? These are just some of the areas where employers can lose out on candidates due to overly long or complicated processes. And I guess with the new remote working and most people actually at onboarding remotely at the moment, I'm guessing these processes will slightly change and hopefully speed things up over the next six to 12 months and actually probably have a lasting effect. If I now move on to retention, this should be obviously a top priority for employers as almost a third to so 31% of professionals said they would look to move employer in the next 12 months, according to our salary guide this year. Now, yes, we may see a little change in this given the current crisis, but actually we speak to a number of people that are looking for new roles because actually whilst they uh, may not look to move right now and the roles may not be there right now, they don't actually want to put their careers on hold and neither should they. And actually this time away from their work environment has actually given them some thought around their career and what it may look like in the future. I think in terms, again, of retaining staff, a focus on career development in the way of promotions, if possible, of course, lateral movement to different parts of the business or mentoring, transparency and proactive discussions about these opportunities will make your employees know that they are, are of value to your organisation and hopefully will stay loyal and work with you as we move through and beyond the next 12 months. Thanks, Scott. You talked there about obviously um, 
the number of people wanting to move roles and what they're looking for. And we found that pre-COVID, um, obviously flexible working and working from home was one of the most favoured benefits um, from the 5,000 people surveyed um, this year. So um, with location and work-life balance, a key factor really for everybody so now organizations are all set up for their teams to work from home how important do you think it will be for employers to continue to offer this as we go into the new norm post-covid and um, to obviously attract talent from a wider pool and offer a better work-life balance to their existing teams yeah i guess if i talk about benefits as a whole uh, and then kind of answer your question further down the line um I guess there's been an increase in the number of flexible benefits packages available this year, which is a real positive and something that we've been speaking about for a number of years now, rather than have the set structured package, which actually doesn't really adhere to what people want, um, which is great. So, yeah, it's nice that there's been a, a real attention on that this year. I guess according to our research, to give you some statistics behind that, the most Common desired benefits, as you said, Danielle, um, are flexible working with 44% of those people um, desiring that. Working from home, 41%. And in private medical, at 39%. I guess the, the challenge is, though, that our report highlights a real mismatch between the top benefits desired by employees and those offered by employers still. And this is still the case. Um, again, as you mentioned, Danielle, working from home was the only common benefit in the top five lists of benefits desired and those actually offered. Mm -hmm. And actually, part of that is probably been forced upon us um, due to COVID. Mm -hmm. But actually, hopefully now it will shift um, the benefits packages to a more flexible working packages than recent years. Um, and I think that organisations that are embracing it and are forward thinking as we move back into what looks like could be the new norm is actually not taking away that flexible working and actually embracing it and having it as part of a policy from both an attraction and a retention point of view. Um, I think that another important part of benefits is tailoring benefits also needs to happen on a smaller scale to reflect what is important to employees at different levels. For example, our research showed that advanced professionals value benefits like private medical insurance, company allowance or company cars, and professional body membership fees. However, operations and tactical staff care more about flexible working, work from home, and subsidiaries of memberships such as gyms or lunches. So I guess it's something that a lot of HR professionals certainly are looking at how they structure their benefits moving forward. Yeah, that sounds like um, organisations need to kind of reevaluate and fine tune their proposition then really um, to be able to attract the right talent and reflect that to the role they're recruiting for. So um, can you just give us a bit more detail about how these flexible benefit packages work um, perhaps in organisations? Yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, we've seen more around the kind of the flexible working piece um, or work from home featured as I said earlier, on the top five desired and offered benefits. Yeah. And I guess this is the case across all levels, seniority and gender. So again, I don't wanna harp on too much about flexible working, but um, I think that given the fact that over half of respondents from the salary guide um, want this kind of beyond COVID, <laughs> shall we say, and have it as more of a, as a policy moving forward, I think then if we touch on the non-flexible working benefits packages, yeah. um, a lot of uh, businesses and um, prior to the last few months have actually been looking at how they can integrate these uh, and what does it look like? What does a flexible benefits package mm -hmm. look like? I mean, there are still so many different nuances within this. So some organizations will have, a, I guess, a, a monetary figure, which will be a flexible benefits package where they can take as much of that as cash as they like or they can kind of almost use it as a, a scaling form of what they like um, as an example they may look at people at certain age groups may not be that bothered about childcare vouchers and gym memberships so rather than having that could they have that as a cash element so their take-home pay goes up a little right. bit more yeah um, so I, I think that you're right and I think that this is forced people's hands into looking at what does a flexible benefits package look like okay 
So tailoring benefits sounds like it's going to be key, obviously, for the future. Um, so how can employers tailor their benefits packages um, for, say, the roles that they're recruiting for? So what does it, can you go down into the breakdown? Yeah, so I think that uh, certainly um, you, you're probably looking at more levels rather than looking at uh, age groups for obvious reasons, because we shouldn't assume that people that are, say, of a, a younger age would like something more than someone of an older age. Um, I think that then starts going into you know stereotyping, which we need to stay away from. Uh, I think you need to look more at levels and what is on offer, so which actually helps a little bit with retention. So if at a certain level you get offered a little bit more, and I know that some companies, for example, won't offer a car allowance for all staff, it's when you get to a certain level. So actually, um, structuring those benefits is really looking at more of the level and how that would break down um how would you break that down um again it really depends because obviously you've got public sector and private sector within both of those areas um and i think that it's really some of the good things that i've seen is around looking at um surveying your employees and i think it's really key to, that organizations that do it well actually talk to their employees not just the senior leadership but send out various different things on surveys around what benefits packages you'd like to see so they can get a holistic view of what the organization is looking for it also helps to retain staff that, that feel like they've been involved in the overall decision of their benefits moving forward yeah um i think where people have struggled or companies have struggled is where um a senior leadership team have made decisions based on not necessarily knowing what their employees want. Does that make sense? Yeah, completely makes sense, yeah. Um, and we saw obviously this year again, salary remains key for those wanting to change roles, um, but closely followed by career progression again, which was the second most important factor. Um, and you touched on obviously promotion um, and it not always being possible within a team, maybe due to structure and things like that. So there may be lateral movement um, or other options. So could you give a couple of examples of other options for career progression um, just for organisations who are looking to kind of proactively take action um, to retain the best talent in their team? Yeah, certainly. Um, it's kind of a question that I get asked <laughs> quite a lot about. Yeah. Um, especially at the moment because you know with um, I guess businesses in certain areas um, struggling to, to almost t keep the lights on in truth yeah. so promotions are not necessarily going to be something that are going to be you know coming up anytime in the near future I think that it is important and, and any situation rather than just in, in the current crisis that we're in is actually looking at um, how you retain staff and actually keep progressing so some of the other things that i've i mentioned earlier around mentoring yeah you know, some people were really interested in mentoring juniors but also being mentored so actually could you have a mentory scheme which again doesn't really cost any money i want to talk about mentoring and if you're looking to to have a mentor yourself ne don't necessarily pair them with somebody in their own peer group um what do i mean by that so you're not always gonna mentor your employees your direct employees shall we say um if some of your employees have a specific um area are looking at compliance of supply mm -hmm. chains or contract management why wouldn't you have them pair up with someone in the legal department yeah that can help them talk through um, and, and I guess there's an upskilling element in there as well. So that's one thing that you could look at. The other thing is looking at, I guess, the job on a day to day basis, you know, has the your employee looked at the same category for a long, long time? Is there an opportunity now to have a little bit of a, a change around? Um, I think that some people can stagnate anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. Naturally, if they've been doing the same thing and look at the same contracts, work with the same suppliers, over a number of years where actually you could change the dial up on that and actually have a fresh pair of eyes look at that yeah. safe category as well as refreshing um, your employees as well so that's another thing that you could also look at uh, and I guess the one of the other things is 
you know, could you have a, a champion, so to speak, on your team or an expert in your team that looks after an element? So you could have a you know, supplier risk expert, you could have a contract management expert that kind of then starts upskilling the rest of the teams. I think there's a various ways of being creative without actually having to spend any more money than you probably may not have at the current time. I guess as we come out of lockdown as well and organisations are looking at their strategy and maybe, like you say, in different categories and areas, it could be a, an opportunity for people to look at different areas and expand their skill sets and look at things with a fresh pair of eyes because organisations are going to have to redefine maybe or diversify in what they do. So it may bring some innovation or a different way of thinking in that way. So, yeah, some good points there. Thank you, Scott. Um, Touching on salaries then, obviously, we continue to see higher salaries for professionals with MSIPs and FSIPs, which is great. So those who are professionally trained and have their credentials um, achieve higher salaries, and they've shown their commitment to continued professional development. So um, how important is it going to be for employers to emphasise lifelong learning and build this into their team's career development plans going forward? Yeah, um, well, actually, yeah, career progression, as I said earlier, it is still going to be key to help retain staff, but actually attract as well. Yeah. Because um, when, and the more and more people that look for new roles now, they're looking at what does the future hold for them. Um, I think that from a company point of view, um, from a career development, it's really key in any time to really be transparent with your employees. Um, I know that organizations that do it well and I know organizations that don't do it so well and actually the organizations that do it well what, what do they do well well the main thing they do is actually they sit down with their employees on a one-to-one -one or a, and that could be a monthly quarterly annually basis and actually have their employee at heart around specific development for them mm -hmm. I, I think too many organizations cast it with a I guess a wide brush and treat everyone as the same to an extent where other people may have different needs. Some people may be happy in what they, what they're doing and are happy to continue that way where others may not. And actually it's a huge factor of people looking at career development. So just again, to go back to a statistic that the 54% of the people that we surveyed, you know, that are expecting to move roles in the next 12 months, I'm not just looking at the financial package. They're actually looking at the career development opportunities as well. And most people are looking to move on because they don't have career progression. Um, I think just on a final point around transparency of when you're having one-to-ones, I would advise you to talk about your own career with your employees, which I know people shy away from. Because actually, if, you, if your employees can see that you're looking to further your career, whether it be from updated skills or promotions, mm -hmm. that will show that actually it's worth sticking around um, and it's actually worth kind of joining you on your journey. I also think that what people don't say is that, and where we're relevant, of course, and when you can, is talk about the organisational goals and your team's goals and where they fit into those and playing a part in that. Because yeah. actually, if I'm working for an, em an employer and I know what the end goals are for that year, for the next three years, and how I can play a part in that, and that will end, enable me to progress, then I'm probably going to stay around. But people are, again, often shy away from that. Yeah, and engaging those people and bringing them on the journey, I think that's really key, what you said there, definitely. Especially, um, and I'll come on to my next question now, is engaging young talent and um, people early on in their career um, who may start training with you and then um, get their qualifications and potentially look to move. So we found this year that salary and career progression are joint top um, at 80% for both of them. So what tips do you have with organisations looking to retain millennials really early in their, in their career? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I think it's about attracting, <laughs> it's probably a question about attracting and retaining, yeah. I think it is the, the tough part. Um, if I, if I, I kind of, if I go back and, and talk about you know, attracting millennials, um, you know, there's a different approach now than there would be certainly when I was looking for a job. And, and to be honest with you, I was really happy to have an interview and I would ask answer 
as many questions as were fired at me and go from there and, and be thankful that I'd been offered a job, to be honest with you. Actually, now the shift has changed that you probably expect more questions to come at you rather than you answer. So you need to make sure if you're attracting and recruiting millennials, should we say, that you need to really have a robust plan and answers of what to ask, of what to say. So, for example, why are you still employed at said organisation? Mm -hmm. um, what are the goals for your current teams? Where do I fit within this? And all the other questions that come along around career development, like I've just spoken about. In terms of them retaining, yeah, that's a, a, an equal challenge because... Um, People in this genre are looking for quicker career progression than yeah. those, I said, that, that are probably in my generation that were happy to get their feet under the table, first of all, um, you know, embrace, embrace the company culture, understand more about the role and then look at the career. This is happening from day one. So again, I think going back, the transparency all the way through the process, and this is how it links, mm -hmm. is that from the interview process, and the onboarding process of that person, you then need to take that forward and, and start you know, reiterating some of the things that you said in the interview and start actually from day one implementing them. So mm -hmm. why should they wait six months for a career review, for example? Shouldn't you put one in four weeks' time to see how they're getting on, eight weeks, 12 weeks, to keep the stimulation mm -hmm. and the communication going around how they fit into the organisation? Okay, some, yeah, some good things there. I think as well, obviously, there's access to more information as well, isn't there now? When people are going to interviews and things, they're doing their homework a lot more on social media and wanting to work for ethical companies who they believe in and things like that. So you've got to tick a lot more boxes nowadays, I think. Um, and people are obviously especially considering who they want to kind of work for and how, especially in procurement have a purpose as well and hit the ground running from day one so um yeah thank you so much scott and um, great to um, obviously have you on board again this year thank you for doing the podcast with us today some really useful tips there and um, thank you to everyone for listening and um, we hope you find it really useful and um, with some tips to proactively take some action in your team and good luck with your um talent and retention strategies this year um, you can follow the SIPS Knowledge podcast channel um, on Podbean at sips.org forward slash knowledge and you can access the salary guide and all the insights, salary breakdowns and detail for all the regions that we cover at sips.org forward slash knowledge. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.